Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thanks so much for joining us for this virtual U Miami Health Talk, Making Sense of Sound, Exploring Hearing, Hearing Loss, and Tinnitus. A very popular webinar tonight. There are hundreds of you joining us, so I know we're going to have some good conversation and get some good knowledge under our belts. I'm medical journalist Ileana Bravo, your moderator for this evening's program, presented by U Health's ear, nose, and throat experts. Our ENT specialists are highly experienced in treating a wide variety of patients with conditions that affect your ear, nose, or throat and can impact your quality of life. Our experts have the knowledge and skills to accurately diagnose and effectively treat your condition. So please learn more about these conditions and the impact they can have on your life by visiting www.umiamihealth.org slash ENT. To make an appointment with one of our experts, call 305 305- 243-3564. Don't worry if you haven't uh, photographed the screen yet. We're going to put that information up at the end of the webinar again so that you can keep it. Now, each year in the month of May, Better Hearing and Speech Month provides an opportunity for us to raise awareness about communication disorders. So tonight, we are fortunate to hear from two University of Miami Health System audiology experts, Dr. Trisha Scaglione and Dr. Brianna Kuzbit. You will have a unique opportunity to talk to them after their presentation as part of our question and answer session. We're going to field as many questions as we can tonight, so please use the anonymous Q&A feature. It's at the bottom of your Zoom screen, so please locate it now and you can enter your questions as you think of them. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our panel. First, Dr. Brianna Kuzbit, an assistant professor of otolaryngology, board certified clinical audiologist, and clinical researcher in the Division of Audiology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. She specializes in tinnitus and sound sensitivities, auditory and vestibular diagnostic testing, auditory evoked potentials, and bone anchored hearing implants for both English and Spanish speaking adults. Dr. Kuzbit also holds subspecialty certificates for tinnitus management and clinical precepting and is actively involved in research efforts and clinical trials. She works with doctoral students and visiting healthcare providers in the clinical education and training program as a clinical preceptor, as well as serving on various national audiology committees and subcommittees. Our second speaker is Dr. Tricia Scaglione, the director of the Tinnitus and Sound Sensitivities Clinic and Associate Director of Clinical Education in Audiology for the UM Department of Otolaryngology. She's board certified in auto audiology, served as an invited subject matter expert, and is an assistant professor at UM practicing as a clinical audiologist and clinical preceptor. She's currently chair-elect of the American Academy of Audiology Foundation, is involved in numerous committees for the Academy, and is currently serving on the American Tinnitus Association's Scientific Advisory Committee and the board of the Tinnitus Practitioners Association. Dr. Scaglione is a frequent speaker at state, national, and international meetings. So let's begin our presentation now, and we're going to kick it off with Dr. Kuzbit. Take it away, doctor. Make sure you're unmuted. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Eliana, for that kind introduction. I really appreciate it. And thank you to uh, U Health for hosting this talk. This is an awesome opportunity for our community to learn a little bit more about their hearing and their hearing health care. Um, I'm here with Dr. Tricia Scaglione, like Ileana mentioned, and we are audiologists in the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. We're so happy to be here today. We're gonna to be focusing our talk today on hearing, hearing loss and tinnitus. So a little bit about our clinic. We are an outpatient full service ear, nose and throat clinic and audiology practice. We serve the greater South Florida area and we have many patients that join us from out of state, even out of the country, especially Latin America. Besides the hearing uh, services that we offer, we also have a comprehensive vestibular balance program and a world renowned voice clinic. Within the Ear Institute, we also have our tinnitus and sound sensitivities clinic, which is where Dr. Scaglione and I focus our efforts. And we offer the services that you see right now on the screen. Dr. Scaglione is gonna be discussing these a little bit later. Together, she and I support our patients with hearing loss, with tinnitus and with sound sensitivities through diagnostic testing, treatment and education. So 
So like Ileana said, May is Better Hearing and Speech Month. This talk is very timely because of that. Every May we get the opportunity to raise awareness in our community about communication disorders. And today we're gonna be focusing on hearing. So this talk is just one of the ways that our department gets to give back to our community. And when I see the work that my colleagues uh, in our department are currently doing this month, I just feel so much pride at being able to be a part of this team and give back in this way. So in honor of Better Hearing and Speech Month, let's hear it for our ears. Dr. Scaglione and I spend a lot of our time looking at and thinking about ears. And so we're so happy to be able to share a little bit about what we know about them with you. Our ears do a lot for us. They keep us safe. They allow us to hear and respond to alarms, uh, alerting sounds like car horns and babies crying. They allow us to enjoy some of life's greatest pleasures like communicating with our loved ones, listening to music, and they also offer us a sense of balance, literally. They tell our brains up from down and they allow us to do things like walk, run, spin around, exercise. So that, that's why when something goes wrong with our ears or with our hearing, it can be particularly disorienting, distracting, or distressing. For that reason, it's so important that we understand our sense of hearing so that we can better take care of it. Dr. Scaglione and I are gonna shed some light today on these three things, hearing, hearing loss, and tinnitus, tinnitus being ringing in the ears. And by the end of this presentation, we hope that you have a better understanding of how your ears work, how to protect your hearing, what hearing loss is all about, what tinnitus is and what it's not, and what treatment options are available to you. So first I wanna share a little bit of um, some interesting statistics. I know that this slide is a little busy, but I really like data and infographics. And so I think that this gives a nice zoomed out perspective of uh, hearing concerns. So about 15% of adults in the US or about 37 and a half million people report trouble hearing. One in eight Americans over the age of 12 have hearing loss in both of their ears. Over 90% of deaf children are born to hearing parents and tinnitus, it's very common. So if you hear ringing in your ears, you're not alone. Approximately 45 million people in this country report having it. And it's also the number one most frequently compensated service-related disability in our military. Dr. Scaglione is gonna talk to you all about this a little bit later on today. So what exactly is sound? Sound is basically a vibration that passes through a particular medium. In this case, we typically think of air, and it acts like a wave with molecules bumping into one another in a specific pattern, kind of like what you see on your screen right now. When you're listening to someone talk, so for example, like me, what's going on is that my vocal folds are vibrating, the air around me, and it's passing into the microphone I'm talking into, and out of the speaker you're hearing me from, and into your ears. The faster that vibration happens, the higher the pitch of sound that we hear. The more powerfully that vibration happens, the louder the sound. The external ear, which is the piece that you see here attached to your head called the pinna, collects the sound and funnels it down the ear canal to your eardrum, which vibrates. And then that vibration passes through the three small bones inside of your ear, which are called the ossicles. When these bones move, they move the fluid inside of our inner ear called the cochlea, which is this snail-shaped organ that you see here. When the fluid moves inside of this organ, it moves and stimulates small cells called hair cells. They're called hair cells because they look like little hairs. And these cells transform this vibration or sound into an electrical signal that's then passed through the nerve into your brain. This is how we hear. These little cells are very important. They allow us to hear nuance in sound. So they let us hear very loud sounds down to very soft whispers. They allow us to hear high pitches to low pitches when sounds are very close to us or very far away. They're very important. Hair cell damage occurs naturally as a response to aging and also by other things like loud noise. Once these cells are damaged, they can't be fixed. This, this uh, change is usually permanent. There's a lot of research going into this area, but it's not yet applicable to humans. So for that reason, it's imperative that we protect our ears and our hearing as much as possible. So when we experience change in these cells and a resulting hearing loss, this is called sensory neural hearing loss. Sensory neural hearing loss refers to a hearing loss that's caused by a problem in the inner ear, so the organ of hearing or the nerve or a combination of the two. Causes of sensory neural hearing loss include age, noise exposure, it can be an inherited condition, like if your family has hearing loss in it, oftentimes you might have a higher risk of developing hearing loss. 
um, injury to your head or to your brain and certain drugs. Um, and we're going to or drugs like chemotherapeutic agents or very strong drugs like that. Uh, when we're talking about hearing loss because of age, what we see is damage to these little hair cells that happens in the high frequency parts of your ear because your ears are arranged kind of like a like a piano almost. And hearing loss in this area can result in reduced audibility or hearing loss, also difficulty understanding speech or increased difficulty understanding uh, speech and background noise. And so Oftentimes you might not notice that you have a hearing loss because you can hear very soft sounds, but you might notice diff difficulty following conversation or you might need repetition in conversation. Uh, and certain sounds, certain voices might be harder to hear. So high pitched voices like women and children's voices are traditionally higher pitched. Um, and then men's voices are traditionally more lower pitched. I have a particularly low pitched voice for a woman. So my patients tell me that my voice is actually usually easier for them to hear and understand. Uh, a problem that affects the mechanical portion of the ear, so the ear canal or that middle ear space, including the eardrum or the small bones, is typically called a conductive hearing loss. This is a, a problem with the mechanical portion of the ear that essentially blocks the sound from getting to the organ of hearing. So when you think about problems like a perforation or a hole in your eardrum or your ear is clogged with wax, basically these are problems that just prevent the sound from passing through the ear in a normal way. Usually these uh, problems can be treated medically or surgically. And because I get the question all the time, no, you should not use Q-tips to clean your ears. Some earwax is normal. And if you have excessive earwax to where it's a problem, then usually an ENT, ear, nose and throat physician can help clean that out for you. A mixed hearing loss is a combination of the two. So a problem affecting the inner ear and a problem affecting either the external ear canal or that middle ear space. We call this mixed because it's a combination of sensory neural and conductive hearing loss. So for example, if someone has age-related hearing loss and then their ear is full of wax, we would call this a mixed hearing loss because it's affecting different parts of that ear system. Oftentimes mixed hearing loss can also be treated medically or surgically, even if it doesn't fully resolve the hearing loss. Any type of hearing loss can cause reduced sound awareness, difficulty following conversations, need for repetition in conversations, trouble understanding speech, and increased difficulty in noise. Now remember, even with normal hearing, most of us experience difficulty hearing in background noise, but people with hearing loss might experience more difficulty or difficulty at lower levels of background noise. So when possible, it's very important to protect your ears and your hearing against factors that can make it worse, particularly exposure to loud noise. Noise exposure is a leading cause of sensory neural hearing loss and can contribute to the difficulties that we just reviewed. So when we think of noise or loud noise, we might think of things like um, concerts or shooting guns. But when we look at actual levels of hearing measured by decibels, uh, oftentimes we realize or we realize that we're oftentimes exposed to higher levels of noise more frequently than we might think. So to put it into perspective, a typical conversation is about 60 decibels. City traffic noise can get up to about 80 decibels. So anything over 80 decibels is at risk of causing noise induced hearing loss. So when you think of riding a motorcycle or, or using firecrackers, these are sounds that are upwards of 120 to 140 decibels. Sounds of this intensity can cause immediate changes to your hearing, which can be permanent. Uh, sounds under about 75 decibels are unlikely to cause hearing loss even after prolonged exposure. So many of us have had the experience of, uh, you know, going to a concert and experiencing, uh, you know, stuffy ears or ringing in our ears after we leave that typically resolves on its own after a day or two. Um, you know, even though this, these symptoms resolve, these are warning signs that your ears have been exposed to a dangerous level of noise. And we should really listen to these warning signs. Other warning signs of overexposure include ear pain, hearing loss, increased difficulty in noise, and sometimes even dizziness. If you're experiencing these symptoms while you're being exposed to noise, it should be your sign that you should immediately remove yourself from that situation if possible. And if you experience these symptoms lingering after noise exposure, you should absolutely make an appointment with an audiologist to have your ears and your hearing tested. 
If you can't avoid loud noise or if you don't want to avoid loud noise, it's important to protect your hearing adequately, typically with earplugs, over-the-ear earmuffs, or a combination of the two. Audiologists like myself can even create custom earplugs for you that are made to, to your measure. These are super um, popular amongst musicians. Also nowadays, there are apps and smartphone features or you know, smartwatch features that alert you to the presence of loud noise and make suggestions like turn down the volume or leave this situation. Music from headphones uh, is not inherently dangerous as long as we're limiting the volume that we're listening to. So a good rule of thumb that I tell my patients is if the people around you can hear the lyrics to your music and understand what's being said, it's definitely too loud and you should turn it down. In your smartphones, you can always set that sound limiter so that you can limit how much sound is actually coming out of your headphones. And this is even more important for kids and adolescents who are starting to listen to headphones at younger ages, therefore exposing their ears to um, noise for a longer period of time. You know, most people don't seek hearing healthcare services until they actually notice something wrong or a change with their ears or with their hearing. So a lot of people don't actually know what to expect before an appointment at our clinic or at uh, an audiology clinic. When you schedule an appointment at our clinic, typically you'll see an ENT, an ear, nose, and throat physician first for a medical evaluation. They'll check your ears, they'll clean any wax out if that's necessary, and then you'll see an audiologist for a hearing test uh, and for an assessment of your ability to understand speech. After your hearing test, you're typically provided with something called an audiogram, which is a graphical representation of your hearing. This graph that you see in front of you is arranged like a piano, like we mentioned that earlier, your ear is arranged like a piano. So this graph is arranged like a piano from low pitch sounds on the left all the way to high pitch sounds over here on the right hand side with soft sounds up top and loud sounds at the bottom. So what you're seeing here with these X's and circles are uh, the softest level at which this person can hear each of these frequencies. When these marks fall above this 25 dB line, um, that is our range of normal hearing. Those marks indicate that your hearing is normal in that range. And where the marks fall below that line, which is not really visible much on my screen right here, um, that's where you can see this person has hearing loss. So in this example, this person has a normal hearing in their low pitches and then uh, a hearing loss in their higher pitches. Sometimes I'm asked, how much hearing loss do I have? Do I have 50% hearing loss, 70% hearing loss? It's hard to quantify hearing loss in percentages because you can have normal hearing in some pitches and then significant hearing loss in other pitches. So we qualify hearing in degrees like mild, moderate, all the way down to profound. So in this example, this person has normal hearing through the low and mid pitches, sloping to a severe hearing loss in the high pitches. When we are talking about treating hearing loss, typically we're talking about the use of hearing aids. Once we determine that there's no medical fix for the hearing loss that you have, oftentimes the next course of action is trying hearing aids. So hearing aids are small devices that you wear in your ears that contain microphones and speakers that amplify the sounds where you have hearing loss. So an audiologist or a hearing aid specialist will program these devices digitally to amplify the sounds where you have hearing loss. These devices can help you hear the sounds that you're missing, which can in turn hopefully increase the uh, clarity of the speech that you're listening to. You know, hearing aids are just one part of um, the hearing treatment journey. It's It could be the most important part for many people, but also we wanna consider um, the, the supporting care that you should be receiving, like communicating expectations um, from treatment to your doctors, understanding what the limitations are of this kind of treatment, and also discussing with the people in your life these limitations so that they understand what to expect you know, hearing aids are not going to um, give you supersonic hearing by any means, but they can absolutely improve your quality of life. And for many people, they really love the experience of wearing hearing aids because it makes hearing that much easier, that much easier to stay engaged in, in social situations. Nowadays, there are recently um, over-the-counter hearing aids became a thing, which has made hearing aids more accessible to more people. But really the important part is how these devices are programmed and choosing the correct device for you. So for that reason, we typically recommend starting with a hearing test that can be scheduled at our clinic. Um, uh, and also if you are experiencing ringing in your ears, oftentimes that can be a symptom of hearing loss, which can sometimes be managed with hearing aids. 
that's also important. It's also important that if you're noticing this ringing in your ears, that you schedule a hearing test so that we can start here at square one. So at this point, I want to invite my colleague, Dr. Tricia Scaglione, to join us to talk to you guys about tinnitus because it's such um, a common thing and we get so many questions about it. Yes, I guess Dr. Scaglione can uh, can join in the conversation. Uh, will she continue with you or separately on her own? She will continue on her own. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you, Dr. Kuzbin. And we are getting a flurry of questions just to, to put you all on, on uh, in, in the rhythm here. Very interesting ones. We are doing our best to address them either written or we're going to try and answer them live. So just be patient and hang in there with us. Very interesting question. So let me tee up Dr. Scaglione, who apparently is now known as the Wheel of Fortune doctor over at University of Miami Health. Patients asked for her since she had a successful run a few months ago and uh, even won a trip. So Dr. Scaglione, now that you are uh, famous in, in other ways, please uh, indulge us tonight. And unmute yourself. Please. Yes, thank you. One moment, just bringing up the presentation for everyone. So I remind everyone while Dr. Scaglione is preparing that uh, you have an opportunity to ask questions of our experts tonight. And as I said, many of you have. And there are hundreds uh, hearing tonight. So hopefully it will be for everyone's benefit mutually to, to listen in. Dr. Scaglion, go away. Thank you. And are you able to see my slide okay, Eliana? Um, yeah, I'm seeing, uh, I was seeing the last presentation. So perhaps you need to put yours in presenters mode, your deck. Okay, so sorry. I don't know why it's giving me glitches this time. Oh, sorry, it, everyone. It'll just take a second, I'm sure. In the meantime, as I said, we have questions on uh, hearing aids. We have questions, even a, a fascinating question on someone who said that their tinnitus started after COVID infection. So I'm very curious to hear from the experts uh, if indeed there is either anecdotal or research information about that. And I think there you are. Okay. Is it there now? You got it. Take All it. right. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Tricia Scaglione, and I'm the director of our tinnitus and sound sensitivities program. I'm sorry, I'm very sorry about that technical glitch. I always joke that technology is such a beautiful thing that gives us access to so much in the world. But then when it glitches or doesn't want to work, it can sometimes be a little bit of a hiccup. So I also want to thank my colleague, Dr. Brianna Kuzbit, for everything she just shared with us about hearing and the auditory system and, um, and, and, and helping you dive into hearing health. Dr. Kuzbit is a tinnitus expert as well. Um, so she or I can answer some of your burning questions that you have about tinnitus. Um, I want to, before I start, share with you that tonight, we're just so excited to be able to talk with you and give you a brief overview about hearing in tinnitus. There's only so much we can give you in this limited time span, but the University of Miami Tinnitus Program does offer very comprehensive tinnitus and sound sensitivity services and support. So if you leave here tonight with a burning desire for more, you know, you have more questions or you feel like we just started to reach the tip of the iceberg, it's because we did. We have so much more that we can talk about with you and different ways we can support you. So let's go ahead and, and get one thing clear. A lot of times patients want to know, is it tinnitus or is it tinnitus? So how do you pronounce it? I want you to raise your hand if you say tinnitus. And I want you to raise your hand if you say tinnitus. Well, guess what? I can't see any of you. And it's actually great because everyone, if you raised your hand, is correct. The pronunciation is either tinnitus or tinnitus. So we can go ahead and put that battle to rest. Though more healthcare providers tend to say tinnitus and more patients tend to say tinnitus. And what is it? You know, what is this, this pesky noise that you're hearing? Well, it's a perception of a sound, a sound that's not actually there in the environment. It can be in one ear, it can be in both ears. Sometimes it's in both ears at the same time, or sometimes it can jump from one ear to the, one ear to the other, or it can be in our head. So wherever you hear it, if you're hearing a sound that's not there, that is tinnitus. And it can present in many different ways. 
quite often patients come in and say, Dr. Scaglione, I'm hearing ringing, I'm hearing buzzing. It sounds like fluorescent lights or chirping or cicadas. Um, but I will say that any sound that you hear, that is tinnitus. Sometimes patients even say it sounds like a pulsing or a whooshing. And I will mention that if you do hear a pulsing noise or a whooshing noise, we wanna make sure that you seek medical attention because this could, and this could give us clues that there could be an underlying medical condition that might require treatment. Sometimes patients hear multiple sounds or even music. I had a patient that said that she hears Christmas, uh, like a Christmas melody in her tinnitus and she kind of liked it. I will mention that if you hear voices, voices are not a sign of tinnitus, though our providers at UM can help you with that. So still give us a call, we're happy, happy to help you out. Um, and you know, when, when patients come in and they want tinnitus support, it is not uncommon for a patient to tell me or tell Dr. Kuzbit, you know, I have hearing loss because of my tinnitus or I have dizziness or vertigo, I'm spinning or I'm falling down or I have pain in my ears because of my tinnitus. Can't you just make my tinnitus go away? It will make all those other symptoms better. Well, I'll share with you that tinnitus is not a disease. Tinnitus is a symptom. It's a symptom just like dizziness is. Tinnitus doesn't cause dizziness. It doesn't cause hearing loss. It doesn't cause pain in the ears. But though all those symptoms can be related to the same underlying condition or separate conditions. So Dr. Kuzmet already did a beautiful job talking about the anatomy of the ear. And so what I wanna do is spend the next 90 minutes taking a deep dive into neurophysiology of the brain. Now, if you flinched, don't worry, I'm just kidding. We're just gonna briefly just mention that the brain is really important when we're talking about tinnitus because even though you may feel like you're hearing your tinnitus in your ears, the perception of tinnitus is actually coming from a processing center deep within the brain called the auditory cortex. So when sounds enter the ear, they go through the hearing pathway that Dr. Um, Dr. Kuzba talked about, and then it goes through this really complex auditory pathway up to the brain. Okay, so sounds get to the brain. The brain processes and, and we have this perception of tinnitus. But tinnitus is a sound and we hear sounds all the time. So why are we bothered? Why are we affected by tinnitus? Well, importantly, not every patient who experiences tinnitus is actually bothered by that. So let me say that one more time. Not every patient that hears tinnitus or is aware of tinnitus is bothered by it. So I encourage you after today's session, if you have tinnitus, to think about, reflect on that. Just because you have tinnitus doesn't mean it has to be disturbing or bothersome. If you're simply aware of it, then okay, you have it and you're aware, but it's not impacting your life. But if you're bothered by it, then we wanna seek help. We wanna seek management to help improve that. And why it's bothersome is because of this little system in the brain called the limbic system. The limbic system takes the sounds that we hear on a regular basis and it puts a label to it. Isn't that pretty cool? It can put a positive uh, label, a negative label, or a neutral label. Like if you hear a fan or something uneventful, you know, chatter in the background as neutral. And a negative sound could be maybe a phone call or a knock at the door in the middle of the night that you weren't expecting. And a positive sound is maybe a favorite song. Maybe it's your wedding song, unless you've been married a long time and then that, maybe your wedding song makes you cringe. No, I'm just kidding. That's just to make you laugh a little bit this late at night. And once we have this label applied, then our brain processes through the limbic system to another center, which puts an emotional um, once you put that, that label, then we go ahead and put a reaction. It tells our brain how we react to this sound. So have you ever noticed if you hear a song you like that you might feel lighthearted, you might start to feel good, tap your feet, move your shoulders. You don't feel that way if you hear a loud knocking at your front door in the middle of the night. Your heart might race, you might start to sweat. Maybe you're, you're, you might not realize it, but your pupils probably dilate. 
because we have this negative reaction that our brain has told us to do. So in patients who are bothered by their tinnitus, their limbic system has labeled their tinnitus as negative and it's told the brain to react negatively. So patients ask me all the time, is there a cure for tinnitus? My answer to you is no, there's not a cure, but that's not your take home message. Your take home message is, yeah, there's no cure, but it doesn't mean that it can't be managed. Anyone who has ever told you that you just have to live with your tinnitus and there's nothing that can be done is inaccurate. Tinnitus can absolutely be managed. If you're having trouble sleeping or working or concentrating, know that the UM Tinnitus program is here for you and we can help you find solutions to help get back your quality of life. Now, to manage or treat tinnitus, what we want to do is promote habituation or getting used to something. We want to rewrite the label in the brain to train your brain that your tinnitus, even if it's still there, is not bothersome. Just like when we wear a watch, we don't notice 24 seven that we're wearing a watch. When you're wearing shoes, you don't pay attention to the shoes on your feet, even though they're wrapped around your foot. So we can actually do that with our brain and our tinnitus. Quite often patients wanna know, you know, what are causes of tinnitus or what are triggers for tinnitus? There's a plethora. Um, if you come to the US UM Tinnitus Program, we have uh, one of the first things we ask our patients to do is go through an in-depth 90-minute tinnitus education session. It's led by myself or Dr. Kuzbit, um, and we really dive deep. We spend an hour and a half really digging into tinnitus and basic information to really give you a strong foundation um, and, and dig a little bit more about what's going on there. But for tonight, for the purpose of tonight's conversation, common reasons that individuals might have tinnitus is because of hearing loss or noise exposure, whether it's a one-time exposure or a long-time exposure like work. It could be because of aging or certain diseases. It can be because of certain triggers. Uh, maybe you have tinnitus, but it flares up. Or maybe it's something that you're eating like caffeine or sodium. So these are things in our diet we want to pay attention to. And this list by no means is exhaustive. You might be surprised to know that neck involvement, neck issues like a herniation or whiplash um, or jaw issues, teeth issues, grinding of the teeth, TMJ, these may also contribute to your tinnitus. So if you are having changes or worsening in your tinnitus with certain head movements or mouth movements, then we, um, then you should be evaluated for what we call somatic tinnitus, which can be managed. And I will also point out some patients will say, well, I have really, really severe tinnitus or I've had tinnitus for 20 years. There's no hope for me. There's hope for every tinnitus patient, regardless of what it sounds like, loud or soft, whatever ear it's in or however long you've had it, it can be managed. Now, how do we manage it? Again, time is brief. So a brief overview here is, one thing we can do is if you have an underlying health condition like diabetes or uh, high blood pressure and it's not managed and it has a known link to tinnitus, we need to manage that health condition. If it's hearing loss, we need to manage the hearing loss. Too often we hear patients say, I have tinnitus. I don't care about my hearing loss. I don't want hearing aids. Well, guess what? Managing the hearing loss helps tinnitus in about 85% of cases. So you actually do want to manage that hearing loss because it's gonna really help that tinnitus or has potential to help that tinnitus. You can use sound enrichment. So keeping sounds on in your environment, whether it's a little device that you put on your nightstand at bedtime or devices you wear on your ears, again, like hearing aids, or if you have normal hearing, there's devices called tinnitus sound generators. Even sometimes headphones when used properly can be very beneficial. And then tinnitus patients tend to carry a lot of stress. So we want to make sure stress management and daily coping techniques are employed. Dr. Kuzba and I are happy to share in-depth um, various types of, of coping techniques, stress management techniques, um, and the like guided breathing to help you with managing stress and, um, and, and similar uh, emotions that you might have related to your tinnitus. I'll highlight sleeping because that tends to be one of the most common things patients report. The bedroom's quiet. You're probably going to hear your tinnitus more. 
So let's use some things in the bedroom that make us less aware of our tinnitus, like pillows that play music or head wraps or little speakers you can put on your desk, on your nightstand or under your pillow. You can pair them with um, your phone that can play certain, certain apps or certain sound files. And um, you may feel like, I like to sleep in silence. I don't wanna have noise, but guess what? The majority of patients that come in saying that end up reporting that the sound really did help them at nighttime. I wanna differentiate tinnitus from sound sensitivities. Tinnitus is the perception of a sound in the ear, but sometimes patients can have sensitivities to sound like hyperacusis, where somebody may be, you might find that you're more sensitive to normal volume sounds. For instance, I had a patient that when a cereal, when his wife ate cereal and the, and the uh, spoon hit the bowl, it was so blindingly loud for him, not annoying, but blamingly loud, it was painful. Um, this, this can certainly be improved. Um, and then there's misophonia, where misophonia is a decreased tolerance to specific sounds where you have an irrational, uh, almost impulsive response to sounds. Uh, this is usually like a mouth chewing noise or breathing or a pen tapping noise that can occur, though it's typically not volume related like it is in hyperacusis. And then phonophobia is an irrational fear of sound. So it's not necessarily the intensity of the sound or what it is, but it's, it, it's this, it, it can be either of those and you have a fear of the sound. So at our program um, at the UM, clinic and tinnitus program, we can certainly help manage these, these um, sound sensitivities as well. So if you, a family member, a loved one, a coworker is experiencing them, please let them know that there are solutions. So what does this look like? What is the tinnitus program that I keep talking about? Well, we know that everybody who comes to our program is an individualized patient with individualized needs. Uh, who have different health conditions, backgrounds, lifestyles. We have you join us for an overall tinnitus education session. As I mentioned, that's the first step. It's virtual. You can do it from home. You can be in your jammies. We don't even have to know. Uh, we offer them individual or group. Most people like to do them in group because they like to see the group questions. And then we also recommend a medical consultation with an ENT and a hearing test with an audiologist if that has not transpired yet. Um, and especially if you have tinnitus in one ear, hearing loss in one ear, sudden hearing loss, that pulsing noise, um, or, or vertigo or dizziness associated with the tinnitus, we want to get you to see an ENT or a nurse practitioner in an ENT practice. They're, they're fantastic too. And then from there, we really just curate the, the appointments based on your individual needs. Some patients will have a tinnitus uh, consultation or a tinnitus assessment, device selection. Maybe you're gonna be fit with devices. You might go through tinnitus-free training therapy with our team or some type of sound therapy with our team as well. And then of course, we have, we, we have interdisciplinary collaborations with let's say sleep medicine, mental health, neurology, and so on for patients who need collaborative care. Um, and so with that, I really thank you for joining us. Again, this is just the tip of the iceberg, but I just really wanna reassure you all, if you're suffering from tinnitus, you don't have to suffer. We do have management options out there and we're willing to help see you for your hearing and tinnitus needs. Thank and you. so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back to Ileana. Thank you so much, Dr. Scaglione. And uh, now we're gonna have both you and your colleague, Dr. Kuzbit, uh, join us for the Q&A, which is, as I said, coming at us fast and furious. So we have a lot of questions and we're gonna do our best. Um, the first that I'd like to ask is this whole concept of managing hearing loss, training the, the brain uh, and so forth. Are there any new treatments for tinnitus in the last few years that are new and exciting and are gonna really make a difference? I'll jump in there. Um, one of the most, the more exciting treatments that have been in the news lately that some individuals on this session today may have heard about um, is a device called the Neuromod Linear device that's coming to us from overseas. It was developed in Dublin. Um, it was FDA approved at the, uh, I think it's the end of March, early April. And so those devices will start becoming available in the United States over the course of the next year. 
please give providers time because um, providers across the US, including the UM team, have to be trained by the manufacturer and the devices are just starting to roll into the country. Um, and so we are really excited to be able to offer that once we can get our hands on them. And then a lot of, there's been a lot of advancements and studies having to do with medical treatments for tinnitus. And um, here at UM, we do have ongoing research studies for tinnitus treatments. We are recruiting actually right now at this time. So if you are interested in seeing if you're a, um, a candidate for one of our treatment studies, we do encourage you to, to just make an appointment with our, our audiology and ENT department. And we'll be able to identify at that appointment if you're a candidate and provide you with more information. Well, that's good to know that there are things on the uh, on the forefront coming down because it's highly frustrating for people with uh, tinnitus and this condition basically saying, oh, people are telling me to just tolerate it and listen to music or and things like that. Easier said than done. It's it's a highly difficult thing to manage. And um, that, which leads me to the next question, um, Dr. Kuzbit, does hearing loss and any of these conditions lead to memory loss, diminished cognitive conditions? That's a great question. Although typically hearing loss isn't a direct cause of dementia or reduced cognitive function, there is a link and it's getting a lot more research nowadays. So we're learning more and more as we go. Um, one thing to consider is that our brain is a muscle like any other muscle. And if you don't use it, you lose it in a sense. And this is super important for sound or speech processing. As we get older, not, not only do we sometimes lose hearing, but we can also um, notice differences in our ability to process speech quickly and effectively. And so uh, oftentimes we can see that this can exacerbate problems with cognition. Also, it's really worth noting that if someone is presenting with symptoms of dementia or reduced cognition, sometimes, you know, these people oftentimes are not getting their hearing tested and hearing loss can also present similarly in the sense that um, you, you may notice someone with memory issues, but maybe they didn't actually hear what was said to begin with, or um, they might start to isolate themselves because following a difficult conversation is more challenging and maybe not worth the effort for them. So it's very important to understand that while there is a connection, if you are noticing these symptoms in yourself or in loved ones, I would consider having your hearing tested. How about screening tests to prevent hearing loss? Is there such a thing? Can we nip it in the bud before it gets to the critical stage? Or at uh, least absolutely. I feel that, you know, it's so important for individuals to get a baseline hearing test. So if you don't have one, I don't care how old you are. If you are 18 or if you are 98, let's get you a baseline hearing test because then if you start to notice changes in your hearing or tinnitus in your changes in your tinnitus or onset of these symptoms, we have something to compare to. Um, very often patients wait until their symptoms come on or are quite severe, and then they come in and they want to know, you know, what's the cause or has it changed? And we really have nothing to compare to. So um, by having a hearing test and a hearing screening at like a local UM does a lot of um, health fairs where we can do hearing screenings or coming in and seeing one of our audiologists and just having a brief hearing test. It's really quick, it's really easy. We have a number of locations across South Florida. Um, if you're not in South Florida, then there's audiologists I'm sure in your, in your state. And um, that way you, you, know, you have a basis. And then also for, for setting you up for hearing protection. You know, that, that if we see you have normal hearing versus if you have hearing loss, we can counsel you accordingly to help set you up for success, to help try to prevent the, the development or tinnitus uh, or hearing loss that we can't ever guarantee that we can 100% um, ensure it doesn't happen. How about balance? This is a, a question uh, of, a, of a wife asking that uh, the husband has tinnitus in one ear, comes and goes throughout the day. Um, but a, a lot of times he feels like he's losing his balance. Is the tinnitus contributing to that? Great question. Uh, that is something that I feel like, as I had kind of mentioned in my slides a little bit, patients do come in and they, they feel that the tinnitus has contributed to the balance issue when in reality, it's not the tinnitus causing the balance issue, but there may be an underlying condition that is causing both the tinnitus and the balance issue. And if that husband, if that patient's husband or the individual 
and I've actually seen it in the chat, a lot of people asking about balance and tinnitus. If you haven't seen an ENT about your balance concern or your nurse practitioner within an ENT practice, that would be your first step. Then they're most likely going to refer you for what's called a vestibular evaluation or a balance evaluation with an audiologist like Dr. Kuzbitter or myself to be able to do testing to see what's going on in that inner ear. And quite often we also do a hearing test. So we'll be able to evaluate for tinnitus and the balance. Okay, let me throw this one out here because there are a lot of questions that almost seem like people have been told these things anecdotally and then they believe them. So things like uh, flying with a cold, does that increase the tinnitus or even create the tinnitus? Having an MRI, does that uh, create it? So let, let's get some of these things on the table and say yay or nay, there's either no research or, or proof of this or it can happen. Go ahead. I'll jump in here. So uh, we can experience changes in our ears while we fly, which can cause some stuffiness in our ears. And this is often due to changes in that middle ear space. Um, and usually these changes in hearing, if, I if there is a change at all, it's usually temporary and just related to that pressure that you're experiencing in the ear. Um, MRIs are pretty loud and, and, you know, most of my patients tell me that they're offered earplugs during MRIs. My recommendation is to use earplugs when you're in an MRI, um, just because if anything, it'll make you more comfortable and at best it's going to protect your ears from that type of exposure. Um, I don't know of many studies that have looked at hearing loss related to MRIs, uh, to the noise in an MRI machine, but I think that just to be on the safe side, using earplugs in that situation is probably a great idea. Probably not a bad idea. I'm very MRI phobic. So I listen to the music and the hear yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anything that helps. All right, let's cut right to the chase of hearing aids because there are so many commercials now. Now there's over the counter hearing aids. Um, you know, what is the typical cost of these top of the line rechargeable ones? Does insurance cover it? And can we get away with the over-the-counter ones that the technology has improved so much that people can buy a in more inexpensive one? That's a really great question and a question that I get very frequently from my patients and, and from my friends and family members also. So hearing aids are expensive. Typically, if you're paying for them out of pocket, a pair of hearing aids is going to run you about $2,000 to $7,000. And that's a hearing aid from like an audiology clinic, typically. Insurance companies typically do not pay for hearing aids. Apparently hearing is a luxury, I don't understand, um, but I won't get on that soapbox right now. Many insurance companies will offer a benefit. So they might say, you've got $500 to use for you know both devices or we'll cover one ear, we'll cover something like that. So it's so important that you check with your insurance company, but also that you ask your hearing healthcare provider to check with your insurance company so that they make sure they're asking the right questions. Um, there are opportunities for here to, to purchase hearing, or rather to have hearing aids paid for through groups like vocational rehabilitation, which oftentimes can help support the cost of hearing aids for students or people that need them to have a job. Um, so there are a lot of options out there. There's also so hearing aid retailers, so places like Costco or Hear USA that sell um, these devices, oftentimes by audiologists, because they can oftentimes sell very large volumes. Sometimes they can decrease the cost there. And recently, over-the-counter hearing aids became a thing. And for many people, I think that they're a good option. There's a difference between an amplifier that you can buy at like a pharmacy uh, and an over-the-counter hearing aid. An amplifier is just like the volume control on your TV. It turns everything up and down. Um, there's really no limiter. And you kind of run the risk of exposing yourself to louder sounds than really that you need. Um, and many people find that they have a lot of problems related to the use of these devices. Um, over-the-counter hearing aids are a little bit different. They are hearing hearing aids. Um, and they can really be a great option for a lot of people. To be honest, I'm not really familiar with the cost um, or the pricing structure of these devices. But I think what's super important is to understand um, the limitations of the device and who is um, adjusting these devices for you. Are they adjustable? Are they programmed to your specific hearing? That's going to be the key because getting something that you just turn on, it's very hard to determine whether or not this is appropriate for your ears, if it's giving you enough amplification or too much amplification. So the recommendation is always to get a hearing test. Typically, this is done with an audiologist and then allow them to talk to you about these options and what would be specific to 
to you. A lot of things drive the price in a device, um, like the level of technology. If you have a very active lifestyle, oftentimes you'll need more of these features that can drive the price up compared to if you're just you know sitting at home watching TV, maybe you don't need these features and can use a more entry level device. Um, some things that don't affect hearing aid price are you know, usually size, style, color. Um, you know, some people think I want a very small device, so I'm going to pay more. Um, but really, it's it's more related to that technology level. Rechargeable hearing aids now are available, and sometimes those can be a little bit more expensive. So I, I you know, I can talk at length, but really the recommendation is to schedule a hearing test. And then here at our clinic, you could meet with an audiologist for free for a hearing aid consultation and have this conversation with someone um, directed towards your hearing and to determine what's best for you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your candor, because I'm advocating on behalf of the consumer here, you know, saying this is all well and good, but I can't afford it. And, and that's a lot of money and so forth. So now let me switch over, uh, Dr. Scaglione. Is hearing loss or tinnitus or a combination of both a process of aging or can it happen in the teenage years from, from damage or, or when a, a person's younger? Typically, we see it with aging and Aging, you know, typically we'll see tinnitus or hearing loss with patients, probably I would say around their 60s, it's more common. Though tinnitus and hearing loss certainly can happen in patients of all ages. It can, we see children and teens and young adults with both tinnitus and hearing loss, either tinnitus alone, hearing loss alone, or both uh, symptoms. And I would, I would definitely recommend if there are any teens or young adults watching or parents that have teens or young adults to really encourage the use of proper hearing protection, whether they're at sports events, you know, go Dolphins, or if they're cheering on the Miami Heat, um, those arenas are really, really loud. If they're at, um, you know, social events, or again, uh, with, with young adults in their 20s going out to nightclubs, those very, very loud. And also personal listening devices. We have these fantastic iPods and, and iPhones that have these batteries that last so long. But then we can also be wearing these headphones and just constantly playing music for hours and hours, not giving our ears a break. So making sure that these teens and young adults really make sure that they are taking listening breaks. And as Dr. Kuzbit mentioned earlier, if you can hear that music that they're listening to, that's too loud. So make sure they turn that down. That way we can help try to prevent tinnitus or hearing loss. I found this question to be fascinating that came over the chat, which is, a COVID, this person believes that a COVID infection led to eustachian tube dysfunction. Uh, is there any research uh, along those lines that you have uh, seen post COVID infection? You know, I find that question a little hard to answer because it's a very, very specific question. And I think that the answer can actually change depending on the, the patient's situation. So we might have underlying factors that we bring into, uh, you know, our COVID infections. So many of us have had them now at this point. Um, but what we do know is that some research now is showing that there was a link between, you know, COVID infection or COVID vaccinations and some hearing or balance concerns. Um, I really think in, with questions like this, it's important to recognize that a broad answer might not be appropriate. And so I, I hesitate to give anything more specific than that and encourage this person to make an appointment with their ENT doctor to determine what could have happened and what can be done to help manage the problem. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. I think that's important, which is why we, we will continue to put up the numbers and the emails so that people can reach out directly to the clinics at, at UHealth and, and get specific help because broad is not, not going to cut it. Let's talk, talk about what can cause sudden hearing loss, which has to be probably one of the most frightening things that can happen. Uh, what, what are the causes? That's a great question, and it is scary based on what my patients share with me. So sudden hearing loss refers to the sudden decrease in hearing in one ear that's typically sensory neural in origin, so it's affecting the inner ear or the nerve. Um, sometimes we don't know the exact cause of this type of hearing loss. We call that say, state idiopathic hearing loss. We don't really know exactly why. In other times, um, this can be caused by a virus. It can be caused by inflammation or an illness, a related illness. Um, and, you know, there is some research that supports that stress can actually increase um, this effect. 
sudden hearing loss typically will affect one ear. Some people are very scared when they experience sudden hearing loss in one ear that they're going to lose it in the other, but that situation is, is, is much less common. Um, sudden hearing loss is can be treated. Oftentimes treatment is most effective if you are seeking treatment immediately. And so my recommendation is if you notice a significant change in your hearing to try to schedule an appointment as soon as possible and to advocate for yourself and tell the person that you're scheduling with that you notice this change and would like a, a soon appointment if possible. Um, oftentimes treatment can help um, manage sudden hearing loss. Uh, it can restore hearing and it can improve hearing in other cases. And in some, in some cases, um, treatment is not effective. So it's very important to have that appointment scheduled with your ENT and to get a hearing test to determine what could have happened and what treatment options are available to you. And you know, if you do experience sudden hearing loss and you've waited a long time because you're thinking it might clear up on its own and now perhaps medical management is not an option for you or is not effective, there are ways to manage that hearing loss after the fact. And so regardless of if a lot of time has passed, the recommendation is still to make an appointment with an audiologist to determine what's going on in that ear and then what treatment options are available to you at that time. That's a, a very good point. Going to a specialist that really understands the problem, because I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of patients get discouraged and, and upset when perhaps their regular family physician or, or another uh, uh, medical specialist says, oh, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal or ignore it or no, you don't have hearing loss, but go right to the source and, and get the information, get the facts. Uh, so I, I would love to leave as we're uh, winding down to this fascinating one hour talk, um, leave our audience with some hope tonight. So if you could both give us your take home message that there's new stuff on the horizon, um, you know, the future is looking brighter for both hearing loss, tinnitus, all sorts of issues that uh, deal with ENT. Uh, whoever wants to begin. Jump in. So absolutely. Now there are solutions for tinnitus management and I have seen cases where patients are debilitated, catastrophic cases, they're crying, they're desperate for help and they don't think that the tinnitus is going to get better. And I'll tell you what, it gets better. But I want to share with you, it takes time. So if you're willing to put in the time and effort and listen to your tinnitus specialist who's here for you, we are here to be with you along the tinnitus journey. We know it's not easy. We all want that quick fix. Uh, we want that magic pill that doesn't exist yet. Uh, but if you put in the time and you and you follow what your tinnitus specialist is, is recommending and guiding you and use the treatment as recommended and stay consistent with it, consistency is key. The tinnitus can and will get better. Thank you, Dr. Kuzbit, some last thoughts? Yes. So, you know, in terms of your hearing and hearing healthcare, you only get, you know, the hearing that you, you've got really. So it's so important to protect it, to have your hearing tested, to tell those people around you if they comment on tinnitus or hearing concerns to get their hearing tested. And if someone in your family is telling you, you need a hearing test and you don't notice it, you probably still need a hearing test. So it wouldn't hurt to just get that baseline hearing test done um, so that you can have that opportunity to meet with a professional and talk about your specific hearing and what options are best for you, not only for preventing um, you know, hearing loss as much as possible, but also for treating whatever hearing loss might be present. Thank you both so much for being so sensitive on, on this subject. Um, it, it's a, a source of frustration and fear for a lot of people, and hopefully you destigmatized it a little bit and, and opened people's eyes. So our, our program has wrapped up. Uh, I want to thank our two audiology experts who are rock stars. Thanks so much for what you do and, and where you are. Um, our interactive audience, um, we are grateful that you took the time to participate. Again, the information is on your screen. Please visit umiamihealth.org slash ENT for more information. Please don't hesitate to call our experts at 305-243-3564. Again, as they said, these questions are very specific and private in many cases. So this way you can make an appointment with our experts and, and get the answers you need. We hope you learned something and please complete the survey to provide us with some feedback, other topics you'd be interested in. And I wish you a very good night, good health and go heat.